World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's John Daly. Admiral Radio takes you at once to CBS Algiers, Charles Collingwood reporting. Algiers is a beautiful city. To the thousands of British and American troops here, it is a vast show place with everything in it fascinating and exciting and different. It's not like any city these boys have ever known. In the central section of the town, the buildings are modern. They're big white buildings, half European, half Muslim in architecture with minarets and lattice work and gay colored tiles. Through the streets, there walks a constant colorful procession. Arabs in their red feathers and baggy native dress, barefoot Muslim women with only their eyes showing above their white veils. And through it all stroll American soldiers, hundreds of them, their eyes wide open, taking it all in. I stopped on a street corner this afternoon to talk to a couple of them. One of them shook his head. I've never seen anything like this except in pictures, he said. And the other one looked at him and said, I've never seen anything like this, period. And then both of them stopped talking to shake hands with some young Frenchmen who just wanted to come up and let them know that they were glad that the Americans were here. Up in the native quarter, the Casbah, as they call it, piled up on the hill, house above house, the scene is even stranger. The Casbah is another city, a city within a city, full of little houses and twisting narrow streets that run steeply up the hill. By day, it is crowded and picturesque. By night, it is silent and mysterious. I got lost up there last night. There was no soul to be seen, only the green eyes of cats gleaming in the night and the feeling that behind the closed doors and shuttered windows, there were, there were eyes watching you pass. This, then, is the Algiers that American troops are sightseeing in and working in today. It's a friendly city. In the week that we have been here, we've turned the civil administration back to the French. The French are running the city now. We are their guests. That is the way we try to act, and that is the way they treat us. We are honored guests. The French are doing everything they can to help us. You can't even ask your way in Algiers without three or four people jumping on the running board of your car and taking you there themselves. And this broadcast, this broadcast, if it hadn't been for the heroic efforts of the French officials who operate Radio Algiers, it would never have got out. And we don't even know now whether it is going out. I'm broadcasting tonight from a tiny, bare little hotel room. It's the only place we could find. There's a French engineer here who presides over a portable outfit that he brought in here yesterday. He's doing four things at once, and he's been doing it for hours. If we get on the air, and I say again, I don't know whether we are, it's because of these Frenchmen of Radio Algiers who have surmounted a thousand difficulties to help us. So today, Algiers lies white and gleaming under the African sun. It's a happy city. A good deal happier, I think, than before we came. But this is a military operation we're engaged in here, and there are a lot of soldiers in Algiers who don't have time to look at the sights. When the Americans took Algiers, they laid a stepping stone. Now the British First Army is here, and the First Army is beginning to step. General Anderson said yesterday that the job of his first army was to kick Ronald in the pants, and he means to do it. It's going to be a hard job. General Anderson knows it, and the first army knows it too. They have vast distances to cover, and they've got to cover them fast. The Germans are trying to consolidate in Tunisia, and they're trying to throw up a barrier between this first army of General Anderson and the eighth army of General Montgomery. So far, the Germans have landed what they call here a considerable air force in Tunisia. They've also landed some ground troops, and they're pouring in more both ground and air just as fast as they can. It's the job of the First Army to get there before the Germans can be strong, and the First Army is racing just as fast as it can. So far, the advance is a matter of seizing ports and airfields like the one at Bone and leapfrogging from them toward the enemy. 
any day now, the main body of the First Army will begin to roll. And when it does, its advance will be rapid and spectacular. This is Charles Collingwood in Algiers, returning you to CBS in New York. And now for more news of the whole North African and Mediterranean area, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS London, Bob Trout reporting. In London, just as in the United States, everyone is trying to keep up with the swiftly moving military and political events in the Mediterranean theater. In the rush, it's hard to fit the details into their places in the right perspective, and meanwhile, other news events, which would usually be big news, are lost in the shuffle. Here in London, we've been listening constantly to Radio Morocco and to Algiers. The political situation down that way is obviously still very, very difficult. In London, the strange case of Dharan looks not one bit less strange tonight. On the military side, all seems to be well, but of course, the hardest times are still ahead. The statement from number 10 Downing Street this evening says that 13 U-boats have been destroyed in the fighting off French North Africa, while Rommel's total losses by casualties and captured to date are now estimated by General Alexander as 75,000 Germans and Italians. We heard Radio Morocco, in American hands, say today that American troops crossed the Tunisian frontier last night and that they are making rapid progress toward the cities of Bizerta and Tunis. We've heard since then from Algiers that British and American reconnaissance parties have penetrated across the border into Tunisia, seeking the best way through the passes for the First Army, which is advancing as fast as possible. Apparently, most of General Anderson's British First Army is still on the Algerian side of that frontier, moving ahead on land, sea, and air as one unit. The British Broadcasting Corporation's observer with the First Army says that General Anderson describes the capture of the Bone Airfield as a good example of British-American cooperation. This Bone Airfield was taken by British parachute troops with a few Americans, all carried by American pilots, in American planes. Simultaneously, the Royal Navy landed a mixed body of commandos. General Anderson said to this BBC observer, a long period of strain, very hard living and hard fighting faces us. This is no picnic. Some of the American parachute troops in action in this theater are the ones who flew direct from Britain, led by their Colonel Edson Raff. Not very long before these parachute troops left, I flew with Colonel Raff and his men over the English countryside, but not very high over it. And they were all eager, very eager, to get over the training period and to start jumping into a real battle. One thing they told me fits in perfectly with General Anderson's words. They said, the serious work of parachute troops begins after they have hit the ground. The capture of Bone Airfield has provided a first-class base for the Royal Air Force. Many of the British pilots flying from Bone got their experience flying from Britain in sweeps over northern France, and now they're knocking down the Axis planes on another front. On the other side of Tunisia, Britain's Malta-based aircraft are taking part in the battle by attacking the enemy-held airfield at Tunis. And the Royal Air Force twin-engine fighters from Malta have made another successful low-level attack on this Tunis field. In a moment or two, we shall hear from General Alexander's zone of the Mediterranean, where the British 8th Army is scarcely more than 200 miles along the coastal road from the Axis base of Benghazi. But in the few moments remaining to me in London, let me see if I can explain a little bit more in this period about the political situation which I was telling you about. Last night, CBS was able to bring you the first American broadcast from French North Africa since the landings. In it, Columbia's correspondent, Charles Collingwood, told us that the political situation is indeed still difficult. There's great allegiance to the established doctrine of Marshal Pétain. That is why, said Mr. Collingwood, Darlan's appointment as head of the government has been so well received in French North Africa because Darlan is so closely connected with Pétain. I've reported to you before on how the mystery of Darlan looks from London. Now, Radio Algiers in American hands is broadcasting French language announcements in the name of the Marshal, head of the French state. At the same time, the German-controlled French news agency on the continent is telling us that the French admiral commanding the French fleet at Toulon, on the wrong side of the Mediterranean, has just taken the oath of allegiance to the marshal, head of the state. 
meaning in this case that the French fleet will not try to escape from the Germans. And now the time is up in London, so next to CBS Cairo and the report of Winston Burdett. We regret that technical difficulties have made it impossible for us to get the report of Winston Burdett from Cairo, but here in the CBS World News headquarters, we have the latest press dispatches which say that RAF fighters shot down at least seven Axis planes and damaged many more between Tunis and Sicily yesterday raising their bag to 20 in three days of assaults on the enemy's North African transport shuttle route. And meanwhile, the British land forces in Libya drove within 180 miles of Benghazi in pursuit of the shattered Africa Corps. An official announcement said that most of the latest Axis ferry planes, which of course are headed for Tunis, have been knocked down. And there is a report that these transports, when attacked, give off a great concentration of fire, indicating that they are carrying German troops packing Tommy guns. The first attack was made at 10.15 a.m. yesterday when RAF fighters caught up with a flight of 35 of these transports covered by 12 Nazi Messerschmitt fighters off Cap Bon in Tunisia. At 12.45, they pounced on another formation, and they have been attacking these formations all day long. Pursuit of Marshal Erwin Rommel's hapless desert troops, meanwhile, reached the eastern side of the Libyan hump at Tamimi, some 180 airline miles from Benghazi. The British 8th Army is pounding its way on to one of the greatest victories of this war. Some hundreds of miles to the north in Russia, the latest German attempts to break through to the Volga in northern Stalingrad met with some initial successes, but the Red Army and some of the heaviest fighting in recent weeks cut off a Nazi wedge in the factory district and went on to smash attack after attack. The Germans threw masses of infantry heavily supported by tanks at a narrow sector which was only about 700 to 800 feet in width. After hours of fighting, this force broke through on one street, but Soviet counterattacks closed the gap before the Nazis could pour through. The Nazis are making what may well be their last try before winter forces them to retire. In the central Caucasus near Nalchik and on the Black Sea coast front above Tuapsa, the Russians are improving their positions generally. If Hitler hoped to cover Nazi reverses in North Africa with successes in Russia, he has failed once again. Even the German high command communique today obliquely admits that the Red Army is holding its own all over Russia. And now... Here is a message from our sponsor. Only a few months ago, a flying fortress flown by Captain Parcell and his crew of United States Army Air Force men was over the Philippines. Inside the plane, these commands were heard. Bombardier. Bombardier reporting, sir. Nearing target. Take over. One degree to left. Hold on course. Bomb bay is open. Bomb bay is open. Bombs away. Captain Parcell and his crew, in the air 32 hours, stopped two Jap invasion forces, sunk loaded Jap transports, and knocked down Jap Zero fighters. Such men deserve the best possible equipment, as much of it as they can use. For them, for others like them, Admiral workers in both great Admiral plants are working, building the finest, most dependable radio equipment they know how. And while Admiral workers build equipment, Admiral dealers act to keep civilian radio sets in perfect condition. Admiral dealers are specialists in radio servicing. Regardless of the brand name your present radio carries, let your Admiral dealer help you make it last for the duration. Or, if you need a new radio, ask him to show you the new Admiral Victory line. Most dealers still have a limited number of both Admiral radios and Admiral radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changes. Once you've seen and heard an Admiral, you'll know why it's considered America's smart set. And here again is John Daly. We turn next to the Pacific, where the past few days have produced important developments. Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. On 
the night of November 12th, last Friday night, East Longitude time, a series of naval engagements began between forces of the United States Navy and the Japs. These actions continued through Saturday, with our Navy's communique saying that both American and Japanese forces suffered losses. It was obvious at once that no details concerning the battle would be forthcoming while the battle was in progress. For to release such details would provide the enemy with information of great value to him. Thus, there's no statement this morning from the Pearl Harbor headquarters of Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet. The Admiral and his staff are calm, confident, and very busy. This sea battle is continuing. And while it is more of a series of encounters rather than a full-dress single battle, it is of major importance. The Japs would like to drive our land forces from Guadalcanal Island and its precious airfield. To do this, they must protect their men and supplies with their naval forces. Our Navy is seeking the sea forces wherever they can be found. There's plenty of rugged action in the South Pacific. To give you an idea of what goes on in this vast sweep of ocean and island-dotted area, it must be remembered that there have been, since the Coral Sea battle last May, more major naval actions out here in six months than there have been in all the previous history of modern navies combined. And considering long lines of supply and the vastness of the area, there have never been any naval battles quite like these in the Pacific. We have to win them the hard way. Successes in New Guinea give our Army planes a clearer area from which to strike at enemy supply bases, transports, and their escorts. As with all America, Hawaii was electrified at the great news of the rescue of Captain Eddie Rickenbacker and his crew in the Pacific somewhere between here and Samoa by a flying board of the United States Navy. It is not known whether these hardy survivors will be brought here to Hawaii. The good news from North Africa continues to cheer our fighters out here in the Pacific. Don't forget them. There's a big fight going on out here against a tough enemy. This is Webley Edwards in Honolulu returning you to CBS in New York. Here at home, there has been considerable confusion over the political implications of the occupation of French North Africa, as there has been in London, particularly in regard to the status of Admiral Dallon, former French commander-in-chief. Washington has further news on that. So Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Washington, Lee White reporting. There's been no War Department communique so far on developments in North Africa, but it's reasonably certain that American forces are now attacking are about to attack the German-held airdromes and other strong points in the vicinity of Bizet and Tunis. There's reason to believe there are about 10,000 German troops in Tunisia and that more are coming in as fast as they can be ferried across the Mediterranean from Sicily. Only the position of the naval commanders at Bizet seems doubtful, and they may well have decided to side with the Allies following Admiral Darlong's recognition as chief of government in all North Africa. As Charles Collingwood told you last night, in the first broadcast received from Algiers, pro-Vichy sentiment was much stronger throughout North Africa than we at first anticipated. Bob Trout has just told you how the Darland situation looks in London. Here's how it looks in Washington. Whatever Americans may think of Marshal Pétain, it's obvious that the old man was respected to the point of reverence by large numbers of influential political, military, and naval leaders throughout Morocco and Algiers. And all these people remained loyal to Admiral Darlan as Pétain's right-hand man. It's becoming increasingly evident that General Eisenhower was faced with a dilemma either of signing an immediate armistice with Darlan or facing the prospects of continued Vichy resistance. He seems to have chosen the former alternative for two reasons. First, in order to avoid useless bloodshed and the necessity of wasting 50 or 60,000 American fighting men in policing unfriendly territory, and second, in order to be able to enter Tunisia as soon as possible. Morocco and Algiers were pacified several days ahead of schedule, and now, thanks to our agreement with Darlan, complete order reigns, and it's possible for our army to go ahead with the investment of Tunisia without wasting a single moment of very valuable time. Tunisia is the keystone to our occupation of the African coast of the Mediterranean. And now here's Columbia's military expert, Major George Fielding Ek Elliott, with an analysis of the situation in the South Pacific. The Japanese appear to be making a renewed attempt to establish naval control of the waters around the embattled island of Guadalcanal. What success they are having, if any, is as yet uncertain. It is quite possible that they may be beaten off once more. But even if they are, we should understand that they will keep coming back and keep trying until they are finally deprived of the means of doing so, which means deprived of the basis from which such attacks can be launched. In other words, there is no victory to be chalked up for us in this part of the world 
until we have taken all the Japanese bases on New Guinea and New Britain, as well as their remaining footholds in the Solomons. And to do this, we must gain command of the sea so that we can move troop ships. If all this can be accomplished, we shall then have 600 miles of open sea between us and the next nearest Japanese bases in the Caroline Islands. And we can consolidate our positions for further operations. It will then take a major Japanese effort to get at us, while we shall have excellent new submarine bases for attacks on Japan's vital overseas communications. But as long as the Japanese remain close at hand, as they are now, with the support of their big advance base at Rabaul, making possible the continuing assembly of effort, the hit down the long line into the Solomon, we shall have no rest on Guadalcanal. The Japanese will not give us any. Their whole idea appears to be to prevent us from getting comfortably set in the southeastern Solomon so that we can launch new amphibious attacks to gain new footholds. And it is a very sound idea from the Japanese point of view. They have been willing to make great sacrifices to carry it through, and they are continuing to do so. One countermeasure which we are taking may prove to be of unexpected value, and that is the American-Australian advance on the mainland of New Guinea. The Japanese, having lost the mountain passes and their advance position at Kokoda, have now been driven from Wairope by the Australians, while an American force is approaching the Japanese coastal base at Buna. There seems to be a distinct possibility that the whole of eastern Papua is about to fall into our hands. And this, if true, menaces the Japanese in the western Solomons and all the approaches from Rabaul toward Guadalcanal. But the real decision will be at sea, and not until we have been able to gain the upper hand there can we expect any decisive results in the southwestern Pacific. Merely beating off Japanese attacks will serve no permanent purpose. We now return you to CBS New York and John Daly. And that's World News Today. Now here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Do you know what radio goniometry is? Well, probably not. But the United States Army Signal Corps does. For radio goniometry is the science by which it locates enemy radio stations. Hundreds of radio terms and devices are unfamiliar to us, yet vital to the armed forces. If you could walk through the Admiral plants, you would see many of these radio devices in the process of being manufactured. Thousands have already been delivered. Many more will be. For Admiral's facilities have been pledged 100% to the war effort until victory has been won. This means, of course, that no Admiral radios, no Admiral radio phonograph combinations are being made for civilian use today. However, most Admiral dealers still have a limited supply of the new Admiral Victory Line. If you do need a radio, see your Admiral dealer. The Victory Line is comprised of the finest radios and radio phonograph combinations Admiral has ever turned out. See for yourself why Admiral, in peacetime, became the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen next Sunday when Admiral again will give you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. Americans, this war is a matter of life or death. Don't pull your punches. If you've not already signed up for 10% in war bonds on the payroll savings plan, sign up now. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, rigged the building, Chicago.